the this the whole being like a total purist and and kind of being puritanical about it i don't think is good and it's you know i've gone down by a factor of 10 to go much further would be really really hard in this society right to, to still be to still be actually kind of like actively engaged with the society and, and not just being like completely dropping out and becoming invisible right two 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 tons of co2 per year is, is kind of where i find to be as low as you can go while still staying still looking normal to the to to people who are still burning 20 tons per yeah so it's it's interesting though how how i'm dean walker and welcome to the poetry of predicament podcast a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems and most importantly our numerous predicaments the poetry of predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace beauty and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament laden world in this episode of the poetry of predicament podcast we welcome uh, peter kalmus jet propulsion laboratory climate scientist and author and thought leader for simple ways to reduce our carbon footprint in daily living peter kalmus Well, welcome everybody to another round of the Poetry of Predicament podcast. I'm Dean Walker, and uh, I believe it is Friday the 13th of April in 2018. And um, I am so happy to be um, hosting uh, this particular podcast with um, just, you know, one of my um, early inspirations in, in my process of learning how to learn uh, particularly about uh, anthropogenic climate disruption or abrupt climate change and um, today we have the pleasure of uh, speaking with Peter Kalmus. So uh, Peter, welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast. We're glad to be here Dean. All right, um, you know Peter before I, I get you going because I know you have a remarkable amount to say about these topics. Uh, I, I want to say a little bit more about how I found out about you and when I found out about you, because it's um, for me, it's a big deal. Um, I'm going to just get us so we can see us both for a second. Um, you know, I uh, basically got my, my woke moment about four years ago. Uh, I've always been a, a person that um, considered myself a, a very caring person about life in general but especially about the environment and kept track of things uh, at, at a layman's level and that's been good but then again about four years ago i got my eyes uh pride wide open in a conversation in a presentation about about abrupt climate change and um i figured that i in order to keep doing work with these folks i was recording video recording it at the time i had to vet this material because it was just crazy it just like blew my mind like either this is the craziest stuff i've ever heard or we really need to transform humanity whether we like it or not so i i set myself on a course of learning how to learn about climate change and then uh, quickly expanded that to a number of other metrics that were equally disturbing. So that was what became my book, The Impossible Conversation, choosing resilience and reconnection at the end of business as usual. And, um, you know, punchline, which I'm kind of embarrassed that I haven't connected with you earlier, <laughs> your, uh, you feature in it. Uh, you are you were then um, offering uh, the free early draft of your book and you were calling it at the time B cycling and um, you've come to calling it being the change and uh, of course these uh, viewers on this podcast can find it in all the usual places and I sure wish you well in selling just a bajillion copies but Peter I, I uh, you were one of the earliest uh, scientists 
that I had exposure to that was being both very forthright about what they were seeing, like this is an urgent situation and it requires us to be, be differently. And hence your book and what you then, you know, come, come to refine your message and your lifestyle. So I wanted you to know that, that, that uh, this isn't just some random, you know, call out of nowhere. And uh, again, I'm a bit embarrassed that I haven't contacted you earlier, but better late than never. So now that I've talked so much, would you uh, tell us a little bit about what you do in the world and uh, how your book got started? Sure. Well, let me start off by saying that we're, we're all in this together. And, um, you know, this is, a, this is a journey that we're on um, as, as kind of individuals in our own heads and also as, you know, part of a community working together to figure this out. So, um, you know, it's good to hear that my, my early manuscript had, had some influence on you and, and now we're having this conversation. And, you know, everything I've done has, has, has kind of come from things that other people have said that have resonated with me. And then I've kind of processed them in my brain and then I put them back out there. And, and I do hope that, you know, uh, a lot of people read the book um, just because that's, you know, I want this message to get out. I think that, um, you know, humanity does need to really take a serious look at how, how it interacts with the biosphere, you know, how it interacts with itself, you know, how, how we interact with each other as, as humans, and, and even also how we interact with ourselves. I think that, you know, all of these, there's problems at all of those levels, and they're all uh, interconnected. Um, I do want to say that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate to be in, a, so I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a climate scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. You know, we're having this conversation on, on my own behalf. I'm, I'm not speaking for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, but I, I'm fortunate to have that, that work to do. And I don't actually need to, um, you know, to, to, to support myself. I don't need to sell the book. Um, so I'm donating the profits from the book. I just, I, I just want the message to get out there. Um, so, all right, so in 2004, I started um, graduate school in physics uh, at Columbia University. Um, and, you know, for, for a long time, since I was, since I was quite young, I was, I was interested in physics, since I was a high school student. And I had this dream of being a cosmologist and doing astrophysics and learning about the universe. Um, just purely out of curiosity, you know, like where, where do we come from? Uh, where's the universe heading? How does all of this stuff work? You know, I was, I was really fascinated by the laws of physics. Um, to me, it's still just kind of unbelievably beautiful that, that the way the physical world works, the way these atoms interact and the way matter interacts with light, all of this stuff can be described by mathematical equations. And, you know, I don't know what the philosophers say about that, but to me, it blows my mind that, you know, somebody like Einstein um, can sit down and look at, you know, differential geometry, a, a, like a, a branch of mathematics that hadn't really found applications. And, you know, he started with the equations and then he, he built the theory of general relativity out of that, which, you know, talks about how, informs us how gravity works and how it's actually a geometrical construct, right? Gravity is, is, is manifested in the universe as geometry. And then that geometry causes things to, you know, the motion that we observe. So um, anyway, so I, I, I continued that path as a graduate student uh, and, and started looking at gravitational waves uh, um, and, and how we could potentially observe those with the LIGO collaboration. Um, halfway through my graduate career, graduate school career, um, in about 2006, I don't know. So hold on. Well, no, I don't want to make you move. Here, I could go outside. We could have chicken noise in the background, maybe. I love chicken noise. Okay, let me go outside. There might be, a, it's possible there could be other noise too. It wouldn't be the first time. <sighs> okay, how's that? How's that look? That is so great. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> okay. I love it. Um, okay, so where, where, where do you think I should pick up? Should I just start? Actually, if I, if I could, I'd like to just narrow, narrow you in a little bit. Because <clears throat> um, in your book, you talk about um, just about the only time you heard about climate change was in sixth grade science class. Right. Okay. That's a heck of a long time to go through public school, and that's the only mention. And I'd, I'd love to jump from there to what had you shift your attention? What got your attention? You know, I've shared just a little bit about my, my moment of awakening, my, the presentation that really woke me up. I'm wondering if you had a similar kind of aha moment of, wow, this is not just something to study and be concerned about, but this is actually something that is, requires us to engage. Right, okay. So I'll, I'll just start it on that and then I'll, I'll let you fix it in post. Okay. Sorry, yeah. sorry about the interruption. Right, um, so when I was a graduate student uh, in physics, um, this was in Columbia, at New York City, and there's, a, there's actually a NASA center just down the street from Columbia. It's, it's right a couple blocks south on Broadway. Uh, so Columbia is sort of at 116th Street, and I, th I think the, the, NAS the NASA uh, Goddard Institute for Space Studies, it's, it's, it's right above Tom's Restaurant, you know, the famous Tom's Restaurant from Seinfeld. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's on like 111th or something. And uh, that's, where, um, that's where Jim Hansen was working at the time. This was in, uh, I think, around 2006. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure it was him. He came and gave a physics colloquium uh, to the Columbia Physics Department. So, so I, I talked to him about it. There's no record, like they, don't, they didn't keep records of who was giving talks, but he said, yeah, he, he thinks he gave a talk around that time and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was him. But he came and he spoke about uh, uh, radiative forcings and the energy imbalance of, of the earth and how, you know, it was like every square meter of the earth had a, like a Christmas light bulb going was about the amount of energy that was 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 imbalanced and he talked a little bit about what that meant in terms of the earth's future and and i was sitting on the edge of my sheet my my, my seat um you know i was i was studying astrophysics at the time and um so this was kind of it was a little bit out in left field for me in terms of what i was studying but i was like wow this is such a huge deal and and how how is it that you know, we're not all talking about this and we're not all doing something about this. So um, I started learning more about it and I started reading some papers and I started getting more concerned about climate change. Uh, and, um, you know, I would meet with my graduate student buddies for lunch uh, and I'd talk to them about it. I'd be like, you know, do you guys know about this? And they didn't care, you know, and I think they thought it was crazy. And I started feeling crazy because, you know, everyone was walking around, no one seemed to knew this, nobody was changing. So it was, it was very strange to be in this space of, of kind of knowing that the Earth's climate was changing rapidly um, and starting to uncover what that meant for our future. And then at the same time, that same year in 2006, my first son was born, right? So that was another huge push in terms of my consciousness and in terms of um, you know becoming less selfish and thinking about you know other beings on this planet and thinking about the future past myself you know so so I started learning more and more about climate change reading papers and getting more concerned um, I even wondered if I should uh, you know switch into earth science at that time so I, I graduated in 2008 uh, with my PhD in physics I said maybe I should start doing earth science. But, um, you know, I was still really excited about astrophysics and I was really uncertain about what that switch would mean for my career. So I basically, I, I kind of, I didn't really have the guts to switch at that time. So I, I came to California and um, uh, did, did a postdoc uh, in, with LIGO and kept doing astrophysics. And then a few years later, I, I finally made the switch because, um, you know, I, I kept learning more about, uh, about climate science and global warming. And it got to a point where I had a hard time focusing on the astrophysics um, because I started thinking, you know, this is sort of like fiddling while Rome burns. Mm -hmm. And it would, be, it would be a great luxury. 
I would love to love it if there was no global warming, you know, uh, so I didn't feel kind of compelled to um, work. I mean, earth science is amazing. It's, it's fascinating. It's, you know, it's actually, in my opinion, far more complex than astrophysics just by dint of, you know, how much observations we have. We, you know, we can observe so much more since it's right here on earth. And then the complexity of all the interacting parts on this planet. So it's, it's an incredibly fascinating field, but, you know, I did feel sort of compelled to switch out of, uh, out of concern for, you know, what it meant for the future of humanity. I got it. Thank you. Mm. Um, I'm really curious um, what your experience is around the, let, let, if I may just tell you a little story of, of my little episode of learning how to learn at my level about both climate change and again, a number of other metrics on, on the planet. Um, and I, I, what I bumped into, uh, this is again about four years ago, was a tremendous amount of um, what I've come to know is, uh, is a very normal conservative, excuse me, a normal conservative nature to many of the climate scientists I was talking to. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I would, I would run a few things by them that I had heard. Uh, for instance, you know, the one that really sticks out in my mind is uh, projections about the release of um, Arctic methane. Mm -hmm. And that there were a, a tremendous range of projections of how much is there, mm -hmm. how long it would take to have any of it release, how much of it would come out as CO2, how much would be methane, you know, the, the different factors that are, are remarkably difficult to accurately mm -hmm. project. Um, and what, I've, what I kept hearing was a um, really a staunch conservatism about, you know, uh, voicing the most conservative estimates, mm -hmm. if they estimate at all. <clears throat> and I've come to um, understand that there is, uh, besides what is whatever any given scientist has just been trained to do, you know, in terms of being conservative until they have solid uh, data to back up whatever it is that they're talking about, which of course, you know, I honor that. Mm -hmm. That's how science works and God bless y'all. Yeah, Naomi Oreskes uh, refers to that as erring on the side of least drama, which I think exactly. is uh, exactly. so it's actually a form of bias. If you if you want to look at it like scientifically or objectively, it is a form of bias. Yeah, but but go on. Well, I, gu I guess my question to you is, um, how much have you experienced that to an extent that um, wh where I've landed is that it seems very clear to me now that be, not just not just the level you and I are talking about and that you're mentioning that Naomi Oreskes is talking about, I'm talking about like the forced additional conservative um, layers that have been laid on top of, of that by uh, corporate and governmental pressures to right. adjust their findings. Right. Well, I, I'm not, so I'm not totally sure what you're getting at. I think, um, I think scientists feel afraid to be labeled alarmist. And right. I think that, I think that those, those moneyed interests have um, kind of strategically sort of caused that fear. I mean, I think it's, I think it's kind of innate to the scientific personality. Right. Um, uh, and, and I, and I think that that's a, a way to kind of, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, to mute scientists and to, and to kind of exacerbate that, that, um, that factor of erring on the side of least drama. Um, now there's a, there's a spectrum of alarm among climate scientists. So, so, so and earth scientists, some of us are, more alarmed than others. I'm definitely on the more alarm side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, I've started to embrace this this term, you know, being alarmed. I, I say I am sounding the alarm, 
because I'm concerned. I am concerned about the future um, of the biosphere. I mean, th these are these are absolutely radical changes that we're talking about. And uh, you know, I I don't know how else to say it. I, I think I think the vast majority of scientists would agree that these are radical changes to the Earth system. You know, that the warming is happening at rates that surpass anything we've seen in the uh, sort of the, the paleo climate record. Um, you know, the extinction, the ecologists would agree that the extinction rates are, you know, are far beyond the background rate, a thousand times, I think, beyond the background rate. And um, as, as a combination of just expanding human pressure and, and, and loss of habitat, as well as climate change, which is like, you know, quickly becoming, you know, it, it's one, those are the two main drivers and, and climate change is, the, the pressure from climate change is increasing, right? Um, so, you know, I think this puts climate scientists and earth scientists in a, in a kind of uncomfortable position, right? So it's, it's one thing to do astrophysics, for example, and to be, you know, studying neutron stars and, and how they, you know, oscillation, how they might oscillate and, you know, uh, how they might interact with matter. It doesn't, it's interesting. It, it's a, it's, it satisfies our curiosity, um, allows us to kind of learn more about matter and the, and the nature of the universe, but it doesn't have a kind of immediate and direct bearing on the future of humanity, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, what does a scientist do when the science that he or she is doing kind of points to a serious problem, you know? Okay. And then, and if that problem is something that, you know, uh, kind of point, <laughs> suggests that civilization is uh, going in the wrong direction and that the whole basis of our economy has to change. I mean, that, that's pretty unwelcome news. Um, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> it, it, really, it really stirs up the pot. Um, that's why I called my book The Impossible Conversation. Right. So, and, and you know, scientists don't want to have that responsibility. They, they, don't, they don't want to be kind of messengers bearing bad news to civilization you know frankly they don't want to be appearing before congress and testifying they definitely don't want to be attacked by you know people who want to stifle their message um they they don't want to get involved in that political fray so so i think that's part of um part of this impulse of erring on the least side of least drama as well yeah. you know i think it goes even deeper which is that you know scientists are as much embedded in this culture um, and the kind of the, the mental and physical infrastructure of burning fossil fuel is anyone else. I mean, yep. uh, scientists fly around a lot. They, they drive cars. They want to go on vacations. Um, you know, they don't, they didn't necessarily sign up to stop burning fossil fuels. Um, they, they didn't necessarily sign up to kind of envision a completely new way of hu human life on this planet, right? So yeah. it's asking an awful lot of them to, to kind of stick their necks out. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that more scientists ought to do that. If, if scientists are concerned about this future, if they're concerned about the future they're, they're leaving for their children, um, I think scientists' voices are extremely important, important and, and, and not just in terms of, you know, carefully elucidating, elucidating the science, which is important. Um, but, you know, uh, a, a much more senior climate scientist than myself, Ken Caldera, said that um, uh, we already know enough to know what we should be doing about climate change, right. but we're not doing it. And, and I paraphrase a little bit. I quote him in the book. Um, and, you know, I, I think part of the problem is that the scientists seem so calm. <laughs> And, you know, they tend to give talks and they talk about, you know, some a satellite that they work with and the data set that's, that's coming out and all the great science that you can do with it, you know. Um, and if they end that talk without saying that they're very concerned, that, that these changes that they're observing are, are frankly deeply alarming and um, that they do point to deep changes that we need to make in terms of our relationship to energy, our relationship to food, our relationship to water. Um, even like our relationship to population and how we play well with the other species on the planet, right? Um, what does it mean to be sustainable? How much space can humans actually take on this little blue spaceship 
that's you know floating through space and has this really these intricately fine-tuned life support systems um you know I, I think unfortunately more earth scientists need to address these kinds of uncomfortable questions head on and speak as humans see see right now i'm i'm definitely speaking as a human i'm not speaking as a scientist i'm speaking as a just a normal guy um with two kids who is who happens to have you know a pretty good seat at you know to the show of what's happening on on the planet you know i'm looking at satellite data sets um i'm interacting with uh, other climate scientists i'm going to lots of talks and reading lots of papers right so so i i know what's going on um and i'm really really worried and yeah you know i i, I hope more scientists basically <clears throat> say that simple message so that the public doesn't assume that you know we've got this under control somehow because we don't we're yeah. observing these changes um we and and you know that's all we're doing is, is, is observing these changes. Yeah. It's up to society. It's up, it's frankly up to the normal people, the average people to do something about this because the politicians won't do something about it unless it matters to the average person, right? And the average person's looking to the scientists and being like, well, you know, they're talking about this. It's still far in the future. They don't seem that worried. So I'm going to vote on the economy. I'm gonna vote on, you know, healthcare. And I'm, I'm going to leave global warming for a later time, right? That's, that's, I don't think that's acceptable anymore. So I, I'm, I'm curious, Peter, um, you mentioned Ken Caldera. And if I could just take a little side trip there for a moment. Um, I, I uh, have listened to a few interviews with him. And one in particular uh, just rocked me in, in that he was the most articulate uh, and covered the most ground in a way that I could understand it mm -hmm. about uh, geoengineering and mm -hmm. what are the possibilities that we could find some fancy technology to save our tails, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, his, mm -hmm. what I, if I could again paraphrase him, mm -hmm. it, it seemed like he was uh, adamantly not happy about that option of, ex you know, certainly. People should do the research and keep exploring possibilities. He did not talk that down, mm -hmm. but to leap for us to leap to uh, any current science being able to come anywhere near scale mm -hmm. at, at answering what's going on, he was very clear that he did not back that. I'm wondering if you feel any differently than that. No, no, I absolutely agree with that. Um, uh, you know. I, okay, so so I have several concerns about uh, geoengineering. So my my first concern is um, we unfortunately uh, this sort of techno optimism plays a big role in our culture. We we desperately want to believe that like we're you know Homo sapiens, the, the intelligent, the most intelligent species on the planet. Um, I question that. Uh, you know species are other species plant and animal species well animal species are moving forward both marine and land animals at a very quick rate they understand that the planet's warming um you know through their bodies and they're and they're responding to it w which species caused this problem this one right and which species still is is debating whether it exists or not even let alone talking about solutions this one right and yet we call ourselves the most intelligent species all these other species are not causing the problem and they are accepting that it's reality right so so frankly in some sense these non-human intelligences you know we we tend to denigrate them kind of arrogantly in my opinion um, and i think geoengineering is, is kind of part and parcel to that we want a quick fix we want to solve something a deep problem without sort of fundamentally changing our lifestyles and we want to tell ourselves we want to continue this narrative that you know what we're doing is for the best you know that you know we were kind of like you know this species destined for the stars right and um that you know technology is always good and we should embrace every technology that comes indiscriminately without kind of questioning whether it might be best you know to adopt it or maybe not adopt it in the long term right so so, so geoengineering is a, is a kind of a form of this techno optimism 
And my concern is that one of the implications is that it, it means that we're going to be less serious about mitigating. We're going to work less hard to actually reduce CO2. Um, a second problem is uh, there's, there's different ways to do geoengineering, right? Um, uh, one of them is to put um, sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere. You could do this by, by flying planes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not up to speed on, on the latest and greatest research there. Um, I thought there was one proposal to maybe add, you know, sulfate additives to, to jet fuel. And then you basically just, but there's, there's many different ways that you can do it. It's by far the cheapest option. Um, but the problem is if, as soon as you stop doing it, uh, the planet will very quickly, those sulfates will settle out of the atmosphere. And then you'll, you'll very quickly, so they're like little tiny mirrors, right? Reflecting sunlight. But if, if you stop doing it for any reason, say for example, you know, you can't afford to do it anymore, or you don't have, you know, a fleet of airplanes anymore, for whatever reason, you know, suddenly the temperature is going to spike back up. You're just masking the problem, right? So this is, uh, in some circles, it's called uh, global dimming and the right. kind of irony of that. Right. Um, so, I mean, what, what could go wrong, right? We, we, keep, we keep putting CO2 into the air and we mask it over with more pollution, right? And then if we stop suddenly, we leave our, um, you know, our kids with, with this sudden spike of temperature, right? You know, another problem is that we, we, we don't know how to model um, what, what's gonna happen, for example, to precipitation patterns. Um, you know, we, we can't really know exactly how which areas are going to have more drought if we do this, which are going to have less. Um, so, so essentially, we're, we're, we're going to be picking winners and losers with this form of geoengineering. Um, and we don't even kind of know who those, those are going to be. Um, so, yeah. And then another possibility is to, to pull the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Um, and uh, one way you could do that is by accelerating rock weathering, by basically pulverizing. Uh, I think silicate rocks and spreading them over large, large amounts of land. Um, but you need something like uh, to, to take one ton of CO2 out of the atmosphere. I think you need something like um, 10, 10 tons of rock. I, I don't, don't think that number is very well constrained. But yeah. the point is that the scale of this, uh, this rock weathering operation would, would have to be at least of the size of the current fossil fuel infrastructure that we have. And again, I don't think we know exactly how well it would work or how it would scale up, but imagine the quarrying and the, the moving around of rocks and the ground, and where's all that energy gonna come from anyway, right? The problem right now is that we're burning too much fossil fuel. Yes. So, and, and we need to transition to, to kind of non-CO2 sources of fuel. Right. So if we have this, this extra kind of energy burden, it's, it's going to actually slow down that transition. So that might be something that would make sense to start doing after we're completely transitioned off of fossil fuels. Yeah. But yeah, but I'm, you know, I'm not convinced that these are, you know, I, I feel like we're kind of grasping at technological straws here and that the, the real thing that we should be doing if we're serious about, um, you know, leaving a livable planet and a nice place for our kids and our grandkids is to stop burning all this stuff. Right. And I mean, the, it, there's so much wrong with burning fossil fuels. It's, it's, um, yeah. I mean, it's not just global warming, but uh, millions of people are dying every year just from the, the pollution from, you know, we're, it's, I've taken it for granted my whole life that, you know, we're breathing in this air. We don't have any choice. We're breathing in, it in constantly, breathing it out. And I've always taken it for granted that it's okay to just burn things, burn fossil fuel, drive cars, have these trucks going, you know, have airplanes going, and just using the atmosphere as a huge garbage dump. And then all these little tiny particles of black soot and other pollutants are, are swirling around. We have no choice but to breathe them in, and it shortens our lifespans dramatically. We're talking about years on average. Mm -hmm. And I always took that for granted, but I think if you step back and think object objectively about how important it is to have clean air, you know, and how we're all connected by this atmosphere, rich and poor alike, you know, what happens in one country moves to another country. Um, it's absolutely remarkable that 
there isn't more of an outcry that you know that that we do this so and, and that we're we're basically killing ourselves you know by kind of driving around essentially um so that, that's been a kind of shift in my perspective you know i i i value clean air a lot now and i think it should be an in, seen as an inalienable right to have to have clean air um so this that, that, that says something because uh if i remember right you live in southern california yeah not exactly the clean air capital of the world no some of the some of the worst air is uh is in southern california especially in the central valley which which um tends to kind of like collect all of the you know both of the fossil fuel and the agricultural pollutants and sort of concentrate it in this this area so yeah no yeah. so i i um I'm curious, I, you know, it seems pretty obvious to me that you are in a camp. And by the way, I thank you for your layout about geoengineering. I'm absolutely with you and uh, appreciate your clarity about that. Um, but I, when, when I read your book in particular, um, you uh, appear to me to be in a camp that I would be wanting to include uh, Paul Hawkins' new book, Drawdown. Does that seem fair? Is that more or less kind of the the orientation of uh, yourself, how y'all are raising your family, your footprint in the world? It seems like, and at first, are you familiar with that? And then yes, I am. is it fair to say that you're in that kind of a, in that swath of humanity that's looking to make a difference kind of choosing a particular focal point and then just go for it you know well, do it. Well, yeah so i think that each of us so th there's you know a, a small segment segment of the population that is is extremely concerned about climate change um maybe maybe 20 percent have you have you seen the um the six americas of global warming so there's there's um i, I think alarmed and that's about 20%. Um, there's concern that's slightly bigger. Um, there's cautious, you know, and it goes all the way. The, this last one is dismissive, right? Those are, those are the climate deniers. So this, this 20% of people that are very concerned about global warming, I feel like we need to do all that we can, now, whatever that means for you, okay? So one, so, so yeah, I think, I think, you know, Paul Hawken would agree that we need to do all that we can to stop burning fossil fuels and to transition away from fossil fuels and to do everything we can to keep global warming as to the lowest level that we possibly can. Um, I think maybe one difference, one, one key difference is that um, I tend to, to really promote uh, individual action as a means for sort of voting for collective action. So action at the policy level. Mm -hmm. So I don't have, so, so, you know, why do I reduce my own carbon footprint? Okay, why have I gone to about a tenth of the U.S. average? Um, well, you know, I didn't want to burn that fossil fuel. That's the fundamental reason. It felt wrong to me knowing what I know. All right, so I just prefer to, to not burn it. And I kind of, over the course of a few years, I made a game of quantifying where are my emissions coming from and how can I move away from them? Uh, right, so that's why that's why I hammer on flying so much because that that was my biggest source of emissions in 2010, and that was a big surprise to me. I didn't realize how much flying dominated my carbon footprint. Okay, so I don't I don't I haven't flown since I think 2012. Um, now why do I? So the other reason I do this it's actually not to keep my carbon out of the atmosphere um, because there's too you know that's too, too small. It's not that's not a significant reduction. But the reason I do it is um, to, to try to shift culture. Right? I call it conspicuous non-consumption. Um, I have this kind of mental model of, of how sort of how we work as social animals. And, and I think that we, we very much tend to look at, look at what our neighbors are doing and what our friends are doing and what, what's being reported in the news. Um, what are the cultural norms? I think we're very sensitive to that. Right now, the cultural norms are to burn a lot of fossil fuel. Not only to burn a lot of fossil fuel, but actually the, to, to try to burn as much as you can. Because you know, having that 
you know, maybe having that fancy big car as a status symbol, maybe going on lots of vacations to far flung places and posting about it on social media. Um, that's socially rewarded, right? That's, a, that's another status symbol. Um, it can help you with your career to fly a lot, especially as an academic, go to lots of conferences and network. So that's socially rewarded. So even though it's 2018, uh, we're still culturally being pushed to burn more fossil fuel, not less fossil fuel, mm -hmm. all right? That's a huge problem. And, and I think that part of the reason we've seen so little uh, um, progress at the policy level, at the collective level, is because no one's actually changing their own life, right? No one, no one few people care enough about this issue right now or you know, to, to break out of those social norms and start modeling a, a way of life that's different and which says to people, this is actually really serious. This is serious enough that, for example, you know, some climate scientist is, is drastically reducing his own use of fossil fuels, right? So, so I'm hoping to send that message and I'm hoping to sort of send it with a smile and, and try to tell people that like re drastically reducing your own use of fossil fuel doesn't have to be this horrible, you know, uh, experience of deprivation. You know, it's, it's not putting on a hair shirt. Um, there's a lot of benefits to, to slowing down a little bit, you know, kind of stepping a little bit outside of the rat race, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of living, living a quieter and more reflective life, you know, getting, connecting more with the land a little bit. I, I love, I love weeding. I love, I love pulling weeds out after the rain. It's very kind of meditative. Mm -hmm. I love growing some of my own food because it tastes wonderful. And, um, you know, I, I kind of get to experience the joy of seeing these plants grow and sort of produce food over time and, and kind of know that I'm a part of this and know that, you know, this kind of good healthy food is feeding my family. Mm -hmm. And um, using less fossil fuel, it kind of frees me up and, and encourages me to participate a little bit more in the community, you know, to sort of kind of rely on my neighbors and my friends a little bit more. Um, so there's a lot of benefits in terms of kind of connecting to the earth, connecting to people in my community and connecting to myself so earlier on in the interview we were talking about kind of these different levels of of, of sort of um that have been we've become disconnected right uh, in in this in this modern life um you know we've been kind of cut off from our relationship to the land to the earth uh, to other people and to ourselves right mm -hmm. and maybe at some level you can kind of understand the fossil fuel revolution of the last 200 years as kind of contributing to that disconnection at all three of those levels, right? Um, you know, the whole kind of suburban model of commuting in this little box and going to this cubicle and, you know, then coming home and eating the, you know, the canonical TV dinner, right? So it's, it's all about like disconnection at multiple levels. So it sort of makes sense maybe that by, by reducing your dependence on fossil fuel, you know, you can start to reconnect in these myriad ways, which, which I find to be really satisfying. Um, so that's, that's the message that I want. I think that, you know, too many people are afraid that, um, you know, their happiness depends on burning a lot of fossil fuel. Right. And if that's the dominant story, then we're screwed, right? Because yep. then pe people aren't going to really kind of want to move away from fossil fuels and that, 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 those, you know, billions of individual choices are going to be reflected in the direction the collective goes, right? Um, and it's gonna really slow down this process of, of, you know, changing the system, right? So, so I think there's a, there's a deep connection between how we act as individuals and kind of what direction the system goes. Um, and I think that was maybe something that was missing a little bit. And, and I, I mean, I know you write a book and there's no way that you can capture all of your ideas in one, in, in, in one book. Yep. But, you know, I, I think that the, the Paul Hawken book has a lot of fantastic ideas, but um, it's maybe a little bit enabling this idea that, you know, someone else is going to fix this, right? Or, or even that we're already doing everything we need to do to fix this. And I think that's a little bit dangerous. I think even as individuals, we all should be doing everything that we can. It's actually refreshing for me to hear you say that 
um, because uh, that that's my fear as well. I live in a little town in, uh, uh, actually not so little town, I live in Medford, Oregon, but right next to uh, kind of a new age um, con uh, progressive bastion called uh, Ashland. And in Ashland, there's a, a, one of the drawdown kind of uh, prototype groups is, is, has been fired up and they're, they're getting going and I had that same concern that that uh, there would be a part of the people involved would be kind of given a, a nonverbal permission to just assume as long as I'm putting my focus on food waste mm -hmm. you know choosing one of the hundred ideas that they work off of and and uh, if I research it and I engage in my community and about that and what I can do, then that's all I need to do. And and enough said. Well, that is a that is a big um, that is a big step beyond just thinking about recycling. So I mean, another another way I think about this is um, you know, anytime uh, one person takes one step further into doing more and, and into kind of caring about this more and and actually changing their own sort of you know daily actions right that's a wonderful thing yep. um the thing that the thing that scares me is it's like you mentioned when when somebody so, so the the great thing about doing all you can on this problem is that the guilt totally goes away right you can't control decisions that other people make you can only control decisions that you make i think that um you know if if somebody knows that global warming is true and they still want to keep burning fossil fuels they'll tend to avoid really carefully examining how, um, how their daily actions are interacting with this problem. And they might look for kind of a token thing, like I think for a long time it was recycling actually. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll feel like, well, if I do that, then I've, I've done my part. Then they go on with their, li their life with sort of a manageable level of guilt. But why not just go all the way, right? Um, and I mean, I find it deeply meaningful to take on this problem, right? It's, it's, you know, in my opinion, and I think there's a lot of evidence to back this up, it's the, the biggest challenge facing humanity right now, right? So, so why not become a pioneer on sort of the solutions on that, right? I mean, and I think Paul Hawken as a person, you know, is doing exactly that. I mean, to, to actually coordinate that project and to start quantifying um, the carbon reductions that, that some of these things can do. I mean, that was a, that was a massive undertaking for him as a person, right? So I would say he's he's doing all he can in his own way. Um, you know, some of the things on his list I think are are absolutely wonderful. Like he actually is the project is actually grappling with population, right? Um, it talks about you know empowering women basically, yes, uh, right? And and it di strangely divides that into two different categories, kind of arbitrarily. But if if you know. Because you can't so, so sort of, you know, educating women and then, you know, providing, what was the second one? Was it providing access to contraception? I believe um, so. You can't really disentangle those two things, right? You right. almost can't, in some sense, you almost can't have one without the other because without, you know, family planning, it's very hard to get an education. And without an education, it's, you know what I'm, I'm saying? They're really deeply intertwined. Yep. That would have been the number one thing on his list. Um, I think it's wonderful to recognize that. It's, it's really empowering. At the same time, if you start getting down like below, you know, item number 50 and item number, number 60 to some of the things on the, the bottom half of the list, um, you know, like, like medium scale methane biodigesters, the actual amount of carbon dioxide that, or, or greenhouse gases that that would keep out of the atmosphere, it's really tiny. You know, you can compare it to how much we emit in a day. And some of those things, if you do the math, you know, they, they basically would uh, kind of, if, if you implemented one of those things lower down on the list fully, according to the, the drawdown um, estimates, you would basically turn back the clock on global warming by like a few days, right? That's how small they are. Or maybe another way to think of it, about it, that's how much significance every day of emitting carbon dioxide has now, right? So in some sense, you know, a lot of the things on the list, I read through them, like oh, okay, medium scale, you know, uh, kind of community level uh, methane biodigesters, sounds cool. It sounds really whiz bang, but when you when you look at the numbers, 
it's kind of a false sense of security because it's really, you know, of course we need all of the pieces of the puzzle. And, and you know, I, I think that it's, um, it's a mistake to try to look for one silver bullet solution. Yep. Um, but even just trying to approach the problem sort of technologically, sort of like Drawdown does, you know, maybe that's altogether one piece of the puzzle, kind of like the, tech, the techno approach, right? But then there's other pieces of the, of the puzzle, like, you know, putting a, a really high price on, on fossil fuel, right? Pricing that into the system. So, you know, I really like the work of uh, Dana Meadows. She, she was one of the main authors of Limits to Growth. And right. she was one of, one of the early pioneers of um, a sub-discipline called systems thinking. Yep. And um, so she wrote this famous essay called Places to Intervene in a System. And I highly recommend that everyone reads that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easy read. And um, w one of the most important places to intervene in a system is in flows of information, okay? So the, right now there's, a, there's a, a really huge missing link of information flow in our economy, right? You can sort of understand global warming as being caused by this economic engine, which kind of interacts with resources on our planet and interacts with human society, sort of maybe the interface between those two things, right? Our economy. Global warming is causing all of these costs and burning fossil fuels is causing all of these costs, you know, global warming and air pollution, and lots of other health problems too. I mean, the, the list of health problems, we could have easily spend a whole hour just talking about those. Yep. Even kind of apart from focusing specifically on global warming. Um, those costs are not being included in the cost of a gallon of gasoline and the cost of a gallon of diesel, you know, and fueling in that, in that airplane ticket that you're buying, right? So, the, so that's missing information. And if we, if we added that price in, then we would set up this negative, uh, this, this feedback loop where, um, you know, we would we'd stop, we basically have this signal to stop burning and this, and you know, the system would start. I'm not saying that's the only solution. I'm just suggesting that you know, there's there's different pieces of the puzzle, um, and I think uh, a really strong price on carbon. And, and my preferred uh, way of doing that would be a carbon fee and dividend, um, as opposed to like cap and trade, yeah. um, because that way you kind of guarantee that it's not regressive. It's actually going to be good for poor households, yeah. and also interestingly, it would lead to kind of an international price on carbon. Uh, which is which I don't think very many people know about, but it would it would this kind of a, a carbon price would would you know force other countries to adopt a similar carbon price so that they could actually trade fairly with you know the country that sort of first did it. So um, you know, we failed on the inter, in the international arena through sort of like these United Nations meetings and to try to kind of extract these promises from the different countries. That sort of diplomatic approach has failed us for many decades. Um, and it might be a mistake to think that something that's failed us for so long is suddenly gonna start working, right? So, so maybe there's other ways to kind, of, uh, to kind of look for this international cooperation that we desperately need, right? Well, Peter, I, I, I'm concerned that uh, the envelope of our time is kind of drawing to a close. I don't want to take for granted not a moment of your precious time. I'm wondering if I could just shift gears for a moment um, to kind of call it on myself. Like um, in my uh, layman's research to put together my book, I, I, I kept bumping into a very different uh, projection of, um, of global climate uh, excuse me, global temperature rise uh, from from some some uh, oil company projections and government projections uh, that were put together back in the 80s and 90s, mm -hmm. and um, they seem to point toward a um, somewhere in the vicinity of three to five C of temperature rise by 2050. Was it just kept being somewhere in that in that zone? was where these projections kept landing. And I, I felt like I was finding gold nuggets, like, oh my God, uh, this says that, and this says that, and it was, was kind of nutty. And I, I kept comparing that to, we've already talked about the innately 
conservative, the conservative nature of say the IPCC, which tends to enjoy using 2100. And, uh, you know, the projections almost the day that Paris was done was that uh, even if everything went to plan, they could still look forward to a 3C by, by 2100 at least. That was the conservative estimate mm -hmm. coming out of Paris. So I'm curious if you have some uh, place that you land approximately. I know we're all just doing the best. You know, excuse my language, but you know, what I call it is we all make shit up. We all make shit up every day about really important things and really unimportant things. And what I uh, find most valuable is, is for a guy like you who you're not making stuff up out of nothing, like most of us, mm -hmm. you actually know a lot and you see a lot and you, it's easy for you to just kind of get a pulse of what the current research is, is leading toward. Mm -hmm. You have a place that you've landed in terms of that kind of metric. And I'm, I'm not going to pin you down to it. It's not at all that I'm going to quote you or something, but I'm just curious because for me, it, it just keeps looking like, somewhere in the three to five C range by 2050. And I'll tell you, it, it makes my, the bottom of my stomach fall out. Right. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I, I know enough to know uh, how much I don't know. <laughs> I'll say that. I, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I would tend to still kind of, you know, we've talked about erring on the side of least drama, but I still think some of the best estimates uh, are, are from the, uh, you know, the IPCC fifth report. Um, yep. The I, I do believe that the that the climate models tend to err on the conservative side. Um, I the reason I say that there's two reasons. One, that's been the case historically that they that they have you know they have tended to. It's it's. It's, I mean, let's, let's face it, it's hard to make a model of the Earth system. We've already talked about how complicated yeah. it is. Um, and then there's a lot of unknown unknowns. You know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of processes that we might not be capturing about the way ice sheets uh, tend to break up, the way the ice sheets interact with oceans um, that are warming, the way the ocean currents work, um, the way uh, forests uh, interact with precipitation and, and then interact in turn with the carbon cycle, right? So there's, there's just so many processes here that are probably still being left out of the climate models. Um, and historically, leaving out those processes has tended to kind of underestimate the rate of change. Um, uh, and, and then of course, uh, you know, I think that there are some the sort of positive feedbacks that are that still have a lot of uncertainty and haven't been kind of kind of fully incorporated into the models things like you know um, permafrost carbon dioxide and possibly permafrost methane release mm -hmm. and other you know possible sources of um, uh, essentially frozen carbon that could that could start to be released as the planet gets warmer um, you know I'm not necessarily convinced that that's going to uh, that you know that's going to necessarily be a disaster but I, I think it does seem sort of likely that it will exacerbate the problem uh, to some extent whether you know a fairly small extent or a medium cent extent or even a large extent I think is still pretty uncertain um, but it's not going to be it's going to be on that side of zero it's not going to be on the side that makes things get better um, that said, yeah, the, another good resource for, for getting kind of projections is uh, the, the, the more, so the IPCC AR5 is already pretty old. It's from 2013. Right. Uh, they're, they're, they just picked authors for the AR6. Um, I'm not sure when that'll be released. I, I assume in, in a couple of years, uh, maybe on the 2020 timescale. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, then that'll be up to date. I think the IPCC too has been getting, the, as the scientists get more concerned, and frankly, as, as more scientists start to speak out about this, then that, that language, it gets easier for other scientists to use that language, even in very formal places like the IPCC, right? So as, as, as things get warmer and more and more people get concerned and they start using the language of concern, then I think erring on the side of least drama starts to get reduced and, and scientists are willing yeah. to kind of relinquish that bias 
and start to say what they really think in their heart of hearts. Yeah. Which is what we should be doing. We should be trying to, to speak the truth based on the evidence as accurately as we can. Um, that said, there, there's still, um, you know, how warm it eventually gets. First of all, 2100 is arbitrary. So depending, depending on how much fossil fuel we burn, uh, it, could still, it could still keep getting warmer long after 2100. Mm -hmm. And then of course, how warm it eventually does get depends not only on, on these earth system processes that are still poorly understood, um, the positive feedbacks that, and tipping points that we might be locking in right now, um, but it also depends, of course, on how much we, we emit. So there's sort of a human, the, the largest uncertainty in this equation, how warm is it gonna get, is us. What are we gonna do as, as a human, as a, as a global human society? Yeah. Um, so, it's, it's, so that's why you know, uh, scientists tend to divide you know, their projections into different scenarios based on, here's sure. if we mitigate a lot, here's if we mitigate somewhat, and here's if we basically don't mitigate, right? Those are the, the three main yeah. scenarios from the AR5. Um, and then I, finally, I would say there's, there's, a, there's even though that's the largest source of uncertainty, there's still a pretty big spread within the model projections, you know, on, on how warm it might get. And unfortunately, it does look like the ones that tend to have more skill at representing reality, so basically the better models, tend to predict higher levels of climate sensitivity, all right? right? So all of these things are pointing to, basically we should mitigate as if our lives depend on it, all right? The right. uncertainty is not our friend here. Um, the deniers try to say, oh, the models are uncertain. Well, of course they're uncertain. Right. You know, um, every model is wrong, right? But some models are useful. There's no way to make projections about the future without a model. That's, yeah. that's the only way. Whether the model is a back of the envelope mental model, there, you know, we don't have crystal balls. The only way we can make projections about the future, which are absolutely critical to, you know, to, to guiding how we act uh, on the policy level, for example, the only way we can make projections about the future is with models. Some of the models are damn good. Do they still have a ways to go? Of course they do. Um, the, the, to, to kind of jump ahead for a moment, um, you know, what, one way that I kind of navigate that swamp that you're describing, because it is, it's tough. It's, it's one of the toughest things I could imagine doing. And it yeah. makes me glad I'm not in the business of, of trying to model a, an earth system. But where I go for a shorthand is um, the people who have a lot of money to be able to sponsor research and to be able to get the best data and uh, at their fingertips is uh, the business community and particularly the fossil fuel companies who need to have the clearest picture they possibly can to be able to move their corporation forward in a business model. And, you know, we had um, Shell uh, within the last few months um, uh, clearly printing that they're they're working off of 5c by 2050 um that that strikes me as high um I, i'd have to actually look at those studies um i would tend to trust some of the um the models coming from the scientific community more than 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 those projections um the, well, the, I, I promise you they're coming from the scientific community they're, they're these are oh, I, thought, I thought they were coming from the from the from with you know kind of within the fossil fuel organizations. Well, you know, I, your guess is as good as mine, how many millions and perhaps billions have been spent since the, um, you know, early 80s mm -hmm. on climate research. You know, we've heard the, the ridiculous, uh, um, duplicitous relationship that Exxon and others, the uh, API and so on have uh, with, on the one hand, sponsoring world-class research in the impact of uh, the anticipated impact of uh, fossil fuel use, and on the other hand, spending millions and now cumulatively billions to fund the denier campaigns that have been going on since the mid '80s. I think we just had an internet freeze. Uh huh. Yeah, me too. Can you yeah. hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. I think we're okay. back. So we've got those, uh, you know, examples of uh, corporate uh, interests having uh, obviously their number one uh, concern is to profit, 
period. And then um, how they're going to establish what they use to project their business model is world class science. They'll they'll fund the work, you know, the best research they can possibly produce to be able to get something that gives them a clear picture of where they're going and what they need to be anticipating. So, you know, I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. Yeah. And I, can I don't, I don't think it's plausible that we'll get to five degrees by 2050. Um, that's just my, that's my gut feeling. Yeah. We're, at, we're at about one degree Celsius right now, a little bit over one degree Celsius uh -huh. from, from pre-industrial times. Uh, and it's already a mess. I mean, 2017 ha had, was the worst billion dollar disaster year in U.S. history. Yep. Um, 2016 was the, the warmest year ever uh, after a string of three of the, you know, after 2015 and 2016, right? Three records in a row. And then 2017 was the second hottest. I mean, it's just remarkable, um, you know, and it, the, the pressures are here, you know, climate change is here. Climate ref refugees are here. Uh, a year ago, I, I would have been scared to say that statement so baldly that climate refugees are here. But I'll say it now because I believe it. Yeah. I mean, climate change is a threat multiplier. We had hurricanes before, but um, it looks like they're getting more serious now. Um, yeah. It looks like fires in the West are getting more serious. Absolutely. It looks like drought and threats to the food supply are getting more serious. So we've always had disasters, but so many of these disasters are now becoming worse. It's like the dice have been loaded by global warming. Yeah. So, um, you know, don't get lulled into the false sense of security that, you know, if we keep things to two degrees Celsius, that everything's going to be fine. And as soon as we get just a little bit past two degrees Celsius, all hell is going to break loose, right? That's not the way it works. Um, but frankly, all hell is already starting to break loose right now for yeah. anyone who's willing to open their eyes and see it. Okay. Um, two degrees Celsius is going to be much worse than where we're at right now. Three deg degrees Celsius is going to be even worse than two degrees Celsius. It's a continuum, right? It just gets worse and worse the warmer it gets. Two and degrees. The, and it's a nonlinear. Arbitrary threshold, right? So, um, so that's why it almost in, at this point, frankly, from my way of thinking, now the policymakers will strongly disagree. From my way, I agree with Ken Caldera. We already have all the scientific information we need yeah. to know what we should do, which is to mitigate like our lives depend on it because they do. Um, yeah. Whether, whether what, what it, how warm it's actually going to be in 2050 or in 2100, again, it's, we can't know that. Um, and in, in some sense, in my opinion, it doesn't even matter because we're already at, right now, we're already at way too much warming, in my opinion. So that's, that's my take on it. Um, you know, I, it, in terms of those specific studies, I'd, I'd want to look at them and then, you know, look at some of the numbers from the nat recent National Climate Assessment uh, and from the, the AR5 and maybe some more recent uh, papers before I would have actually made my best guess of what 2050 would be. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I, I understand the discomfort with, you know, kind of the... Yeah, I, I do feel comfortable saying that that five degrees is it's probably implausible, yeah. Got it. Well, um, Peter, I, I, I know we've got to let you go. Um, I'd, I'd like to just recap a little bit, and um, I want to bring up I just saw a film last night that I'd like to recommend to you if you haven't seen it already. It's called um, Reluctant Radical. And it's about Ken Ward. Uh, he's one of uh, a handful of uh, activists who have been called valve turners in the, in the past couple mm -hmm. of years. People who have uh, consciously uh, taken on uh, hands-on direct activism to make a statement uh, that that really th that things are as serious as you and I've been talking about today, and they're taking it to a scale that is extraordinary. And and what I'd like to offer, if if again you haven't seen the film, is there's a, a point at which he was sharing about how he was trying to share his urgency, his sense of this is really important and we need to do something extraordinarily different on a huge scale and how um, very difficult that was for the people in his life to hear. Mm -hmm. 
and um, I, I wanted to just offer you that that perhaps that would be a validation of what you shared early in our conversation here about how that was difficult for you to share with with uh, your cohort your, with your your mm -hmm. uh, fellow scientists who weren't in in unrelated fields and they just didn't get it they didn't get you and they didn't get it and that was uh uncomfortable at, at least is what i was hearing so i want to just acknowledge that there is a small cadre of people around the world in uh, uh varying um degrees of engagement you know engaging as best they can at the level that's appropriate for their life and uh, I really want to thank you and acknowledge you for uh, what I experienced to be, and I acknowledge you again in, in my book for this, there's a way that you open up your life and you share quite openly that this is not an easy thing, but it actually got easier and easier as you engaged more and more and you all made it just a part of how you do your life and your family. Yeah. I think that is a, a, a real gift to us, to people, who, especially for people who are wrestling with the first level of the immense discomfort and distaste for any of it, it's like, it, it, for many people, it just makes their head explode. And I think what you've given is, is uh, a, a look into a family um, that, that's really doing what they can at the level of a family. And wow. in, in one of the toughest environments in the country la you know like you just don't talk about that stuff in la so well, i want to thank you for that and, and acknowledge that you've found a particular swath of you know where you hold your conversation and i was just mentioning the the ken ward and and the val turners uh for a perhaps a larger political and direct action kind of expression that there are those you know, everybody just chooses the place that works for them. Yeah, well, thank you. You've chosen a strong area, and I really appreciate it. I think that I think that I have a role to play. Um, I I'd like to say that, you know, I am fully aware that there there's so many people who are who are doing far more than me. Mm -hmm. There's people who live on less fossil fuel than I do. You know, there's the the valve turners and Tim DeChristopher who are literally putting their bodies on the line. And I'd like to say that they're personal heroes of mine. And um, what the reason I th think it's important to say that is because um, I think there's still a lot of people that don't agree with that sentiment. Um, right. You know, people that that haven't that are, that that haven't that are still more kind of invested in the the cultural norms of burning fossil fuel than than i am than the valve turners are yeah and i think it's important for more people to just say it plainly that these people are heroes um you know just recently in massachusetts uh there there was a, a group of uh, of civil disobedience um tim de christopher was part of it and his his uh his the group that he has there in um uh, in massachusetts mm -hmm. Um, they 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 pleaded the necessity defense, right? And it was upheld for the first time. I believe that's the first time it's ever been upheld in um, a civil disobedience uh, case like that, which is remarkable. Um, yeah. Some some of the some some of the direct action people. Uh, the, the, one of the problems they have is that the judge will argue that um, that that all legal recourse hasn't been exhausted yet that there's more that the people could have done legally right um which i think is really interesting um in, in the context of my own life because you know i i feel like i've reduced my own fossil fuel, fuel use i've tr changed my career from astrophysics to climate science i'm speaking out you know I, i've been trying to get a group of scientists to speak out more and uh, you know get a group of scientists and academics to kind of try to push institutions to fly less, you know, through this project that I have called noflyclimatesci.org. Um, so it's, it's hard for me to imagine doing more uh, to address this problem uh, legally right now, um, which is interesting. And I think there's going to be more and more people like that who are doing everything they can, uh, you know, without breaking the law and with the kind of the judiciary starting to see that this really is a, an existential threat to our kids 
you know, the canonical, um, the canonical case for, uh, for the necessity of defense is, you know, a kid falling down a well, right? And it's on private property and you see this happen. So you trespass to save the kid, right? You're not going to be, they won't be able to prosecute you for trespassing in that case, right? Because there was an immediate. So, so more and more climate change is being seen as it rightly should be as a direct threat to our children. Right. So as as that as the judiciary starts to shift its culture to accepting that and as more and more people start to do everything they can at the legal level, you know, I think that civil disobedience will become an increasingly effective approach. And, um, you know, I know there's probably a lot of people out there, maybe people listening who who kind of disagree with that. Um, but that's that's actually why I'm saying it is because I want that I, I want that sentiment to be normalized more. Right? I think that. This really is a clear and present danger. And I think that the people who have gotten to the point where they're, they're willing to put their lives literally on the line like that uh, will be seen in the future. History will view them as heroes. So I, I, want, I want to make that clear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's de definitely where the film that I saw last night, the reluctant radical, that's, that's where they landed. And um, so you're you're right on track with Ken Ward and Michael Foster and and the other um, valve turners in terms of you know tracking just where our culture is and uh, how folks hopefully will will be remembered. You know, Peter Kalmus, I, it's just been a, a, a real joy to speak with you. Uh, really appreciate um, you turned out to actually have a bit more of a um, a stance on a on a on the leading edge what i consider the leading edge or the more risky edge of uh, how you talk about these issues and i really appreciate that um, i know that it is a bit risky to to go out you know off of the conservative foundation or ground that we've talked about and to head a bit more toward the uh, the more urgent interpretation. Um, this, for, stuff is, this stuff is far more important than the success of my career, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. so hopefully I can have both, but you know, um, you know, frankly, my kids come first and, and I'm going to keep speaking out because uh, we need to, we need to be doing a lot more than we're doing. Great. Well, I uh, hope that uh, we can talk again. And I want you to know how much I appreciate and uh, speak highly of your um, your book being the change, and um, I just wish you well in that in that balancing act that you got to be in to be able to be the the loving uh, um, and thoughtful father that you're obviously being, and then also to be a part of a the machine, you know, academics and science and this incredible uh, human operating system that is so much a detriment to our well being. Um, I think you're dancing really well, and it's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Thanks for having me on, Dean. Hang on just a second. Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast, produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance, www.livingresilience.net. Music today from Michael Hedges, as always, and also Port Blue into the Sea. You may want to check out our sister podcasts, The New Lifeboat Hour with Carolyn Baker on Podbean and at carolynbaker.net. Also, The Impossible Conversation podcast, another channel on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us. Join us again later for another episode of The Poetry of Predicament.